Hello everyone, welcome to the Iceberg Lounge. I'm your host, Thomas Engel, and on today's show we'll be talking to Tim Disbro, who is the director, editor, producer, and director of photography for the pro wrestling documentary, Card Subject to Change. So, let's get into the interview with Tim Disbro. Hey, this is Thomas Engel. Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. How about you? Doing excellent. Doing excellent. Um, yeah, so how's the quarantine going? Well, you know, just trying to stay inside. I live, you know, uh, about 45 minutes from uh, Manhattan, so a little, uh, a little scary around here, but, you know, trying to keep ourselves, uh, keep ourselves safe. Yeah, currently right now in um, my state, I live in Alabama, so our main hot spot is Birmingham. Yeah, it's pretty scary, but hopefully it'll uh, hopefully we get ahead of it and everyone uh, you know, ends up okay. Let's go ahead and get into it. Um, so tell tell me a little bit more about you. Um, kind of a little summary about yourself. Sure. Um, I am a uh, filmmaker, television producer. Uh, my first uh, feature film was Card to Change. Um, did that after a few years of working in independent wrestling. Uh, I was a referee. I originally thought I was going to uh, be a wrestler, but uh, I was not graced uh, with a, the athletic ability or uh, <laughs> fitness level uh, needed. I was uh, about, you know, Hundred pounds soaking wet, um, so uh, became a referee. Referee uh, for a bunch of independent shows and stuff. And then, uh, you know, once I started studying film, uh, sort of melded the two together. Yeah, um, yeah. I was looking looking through your Instagram, and I saw that you are a uh, big pro wrestling fan. Huge, yeah, yeah. My uh, my childhood was basically uh, movies and uh, WWF. <laughs> nice. Nice. So, what got you wanting to do this documentary? Uh, when I was about uh, 15, I, I found myself working uh, for some New Jersey uh, independent wrestling companies. I was setting up the ring and you know setting up the chairs, anything I could do to, to get close to the business because uh, I, I loved it for so long. Um, you know, I've been a fan going to independent shows for a long time, and then, you know, ended up working uh, with some some promotions there, NWA, uh, New Jersey at the time, which became NWS later on. Um, but you know, it was it, it was uh, being around it uh, for a while, and then refereeing, and you know, being able to work uh, on shows for you know about three or four years. Um, you know, got to referee hundreds of matches with a bunch of people who I who I admire and respect and watched on TV growing up. So it was very exciting. And you know, but once I started becoming more active in film uh, and going to film school and whatnot, it, it seemed like a an obvious sort of choice. I had uh, I had access, and it was just such an incredible uh, cast of characters just uh, around me all the time. It seemed like the obvious obvious thing to turn a camera on. Yeah, yeah, and I, I could tell through the documentary about the passion you had for it um definitely with kind of the the people that were kind of showcased in there um starting off with uh dapper johnny falco the owner of the independent company that he was mainly focused on um so i'm guessing he was he was your your boss um up until that time yeah, yeah, he, uh, you know, he was the person who sort of, you know, gave me the opportunity, uh, you know, to sort of, you know, let me, I don't want to say pay my dues or whatever, but, you know, let me sort of do some grunt work for a few years and uh, set up the ring and set up the chairs and help him out. And then, yeah, I, uh, I, he let me, uh, you know, sort of brought me, you know, into the locker room for the first time and let me sort of learn the ropes and, you know, put me uh, in with a, a great bunch of bunch of independent wrestlers uh, who had come up the, the hard way and taught me sort of the way it was and, and yeah he was uh, he was the boss so he was the first person that sort of on board 
when I wanted to make the documentary. Yeah, and throughout the whole um, documentary, it was interesting to to see what all he had to go through just to set up a show, like going around setting up posters. Um, yeah. And just making sure everyone was there, because I know at one point he had a had a problem about um, getting Trent Acid there at one point. Um, sure, yeah. And and Trent Acid's story in there to me is very strong because he was with my wrestling knowledge. He could have. He could have been something very special. Um, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, he. He was the, the the next thing. You know, everyone was anticipating he was going to be, you know, on TV within a matter of. Uh, it, everyone sort of thought it was a little, you know, strange that he wasn't on TV yet. You know, he was so so good at that at that time. Yeah, I no mean, doubt. he was so loved. You know, I believe at one point there was a, a tournament, and it's probably still going on. That's that's named after him. Um, yeah. yeah. And so yeah, he was, you know, he was in Ring of Honor and Combat Zone wrestling at the time, and this is you know early two thousands, um, which is weird to say. It feels like a long time ago, but you know, at that time he was he was uh, a hot property on the on the independent scene, and I knew him from being around shows because when he wasn't doing the bigger shows combat zone and and uh pwu uh, at the time and, and shows like that ring of honor he was working uh on nws shows so i knew him from, from being around those shows yeah and it's just um something that was interesting to me was during the extended part of the documentary <laughs> the story between jake roberts Terry Funk and Trent Acid and how it seems like this one story tied all these three together um yeah yeah Jake was around Trent quite a bit they they traveled to Europe together and did a tour of Europe uh, at one point and became very close and I know Trent took you know sort of under his wing a little bit and tried to you know keep him I'm on a straight now at that time, you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, really push his, his career forward. And, uh, you know, I remembered when we interviewed uh, Terry Funk after shooting with Jake and, and Trent, and uh, I was sitting there with Terry, and I just sort of off the cuff said, hey, you know, one time he told uh, Jake this story, and he remembered exactly what I was talking about. So, yeah, it was... Uh, it was a, a, an interesting dynamic with Jake and, and Trent. You know, that was very much, um, you know, Jake looking after Trent and then, you know, passing along the advice he had gotten so many years previously from a, a, an absolute legend like Terry Funk. Yeah, it, it's just, you know, looking back from the year that we're at now, like seeing how Jake now is you know completely sober now from where he was at thanks to DDP and then now is in AEW as a manager and seeing his promos that are still just jaw dropping you know it's kind of wondered you know what if Trent would have got on the straight and narrow also you know, maybe Jake could have could have been like sort of a manager for him too, like kind of like he is now with uh, with uh, formerly known as uh, Lance Archer. Right. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, I, I think you know, had had Trent sort of not you know uh, succumbed to the the demons, as it were, I, I think he had a huge, huge potential. To it was only twenty nine when he passed away. Um, you know, he was a young guy, so I think he had a lot, a lot ahead of him, and he obviously got the attention of, of people who, you know, know, know the business better than anyone. So I think, yeah, definitely, he could have, could have had a lot of, a lot of future with the people who, uh, you know, who saw the, the talent. In him. And a uh, another kind of person that was focused on during this was Kevin Sullivan. 
Um, that's master. <laughs> yeah, he, which now literally within the past like month, uh, his name's kind of gotten back up thanks to um, Vice TV with their Dark Side of the Ring episodes on Chris Benoit. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And it, it was it, it was interesting seeing how. Because it is, it's like, I heard a quote in there where it was like, you start on the independent circuit and you die on the independent circuit. Yeah. And it, it just hit me like, thinking about it, yeah, it's true. Because usually afterwards, you're doing independent shows and like uh, conventions mostly. Yeah. And... With his history, you know, he was probably one of the greatest uh, bookers slash story storytellers back in WCW. Without a doubt, yeah, without a doubt. Um, I mean, so great to the point to where he like booked his own divorce without knowing it. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's a better or worse. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so I also saw where he um, did a good bit with with this movie. What what all did he do to help you with this doc? Well, he was one of the first people at that time when we first started making the film. Uh, you know, we started shooting with NWS and, and Dapper John, um, and Kevin was coming around quite a bit, and he was working for NWS at that time, um, doing some doing some dates around New Jersey. Uh, with that, with that company. So when he was around, um, you know, and he was working closely with uh, the, the gentleman who produced the film, James the Basis, uh, and he was doing, uh, handling his business. So when it, when it came in, the uh, time that we were shooting the film, Kevin was around and it seemed like a natural fit. And uh, Kevin was a huge, hugely instrumental in, you know, sort of once the film started to focus on Kevin a lot, then you know it was uh, the, the the network becomes a lot bigger uh, because you know who doesn't cover them uh, you know, Good point. Like, Good uh, point. Uh, so you know it was uh, once once we sort of started filming with Kevin, he was just naturally around uh, so many of these legends and icons in the business that it sort it certainly helped um, you know get get a lot of those people involved in the film because they were just around. Um, not that they were necessarily favors or, you know, he wasn't um, uh, sort of calling and begging people in any way. They would just, you know, we would meet up with Kevin and Terry Funk, you know, would, would be there or you know, people would be there um, and be around. So it was a, a sort of a natural synergy. Did you ever kind of mark out around these legends? Like, like Terry, yeah, like, yeah. yeah, I was about to say, cause like with me, I, it would be very hard for me not to be like, I am in a room, not only with Terry Funk, but Kevin Sullivan. Yeah. I mean, you know, I had been, um, working, you know, on shows with people. Uh, so some of them I had already, you know, encountered or worked with on, on independent shows. Um, but yeah, I mean, Without a doubt, I remember the first time talking to Terry Funk, uh, rounding a corner and hearing his voice. I heard him before I saw him. Just talking to Kevin, and just hearing that that voice, you know, that iconic, you know, in, in, in so many promos over the years. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Terry Funk, uh, you know, was my hero. Uh, you know, that's my that's my favorite person to watch ever to this day. Um, so yeah, without without a doubt, I, I was. You know, I was certainly starstruck by. A lot of these guys had to sort of quickly pull myself together to uh, act like a professional. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's actually two connections uh, to the state that uh, I live in, Alabama. That's that's within your documentary. Um, you have Percy Pringle the third, otherwise known as Paul Bear in uh, WWF WWE. And sensational Sherry Martell, um, cause Percy Pringle the uh, third, his uh, other job was in Alabama in Mobile, and 
Sherry Martell's kind of last year's was in Birmingham. That's where she lived. Um, how was it around them and how, just how were they? Percy uh, was was in NWS at the time. He was working a lot for NWS in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, managing a few different people uh, for NWS, one of them being Kamala. Um, and he also managed Luna Vachon for NWS. Um, so he was around when we started filming, and uh, very quickly, I, I became pretty close with Percy during that time for a few years there. And, um, you know, he was absolutely the nicest human being. Uh, I, I, you know, every year on my birthday at uh, 1201, right after midnight, I could always count on getting a message from Percy saying happy birthday, Tim. Wow. Uh, you know, he, he was an absolutely wonderful, wonderful man. And, uh, I was uh, crushed when he passed away. You know that was that that hit me very 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 hard because he was a, a huge supporter of, of the film. Um, you know, years after we made the movie, you know, and the movie was done, he would uh, I would see him at conventions and things, um, and he would you know call me over and introduce me to different people, and tell them how great the movie was and how you know how he enjoyed being a part of it. So yeah, he, he was hugely uh, supportive of the movie and, and really. A, I considered him a friend, uh, and it was, you know, devastating when he passed away. And yes, you, a lot of people don't realize that he was actually a, a funeral director uh, in Mobile. Um, and yeah, he, that that was not only was it his character, but like he uh, lived it. Real job, yep. <laughs> yep. That was his real job, and a lot of people don't realize that. And that was uh, the story goes the way he told me is that WWF at the time didn't even know that they just needed someone to take over for Bruce Pritchard, who was uh, gonna go behind the scenes and manage The Undertaker. Um, and uh, yeah, they, he, they just so happened to give him a character that was pretty, pretty. you know, life imitates, uh, in this case, art imitates life. So. Yeah, um, usually the best pro wrestling characters are just themselves just turned up a little bit. Absolutely, in Percy's case, it was turned up quite a bit. <laughs> Percy, was, per, Percy was pretty far from from the, uh, the the Paul Bear character, but Percy was uh, absolutely a, a great guy. Um, yeah, and, and spent some time with Sherry Martell. Uh, she was also around at that time, doing conventions and whatnot. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, the the interview in the movie uh, is the last interview with Sherry Martell. She she passed away very shortly thereafter. Um, after we filmed that, uh, that was shocking. I mean, we were. I was around her uh, for basically a three-day weekend at a convention, um, and, and you know was spending time, a lot of time with her. And she was so sweet. And you know, at the end of all that, um, I remember she called me, and I, I was about to leave, um, and she called me on the phone and said, "You can't leave because we need to take a picture together." And I, I just thought that was really sweet. And, uh, she was a very, very, very sweet person. Like I said, it was really shocking because just a few weeks uh, after that time, she. She passed away. Yeah, um, and it it was it was awesome to kind of see some footage of her um, on on the independence from what it looked like, um, and it, it was it was just not it was just nice seeing her, and um, when when it showed in the movie that was her last interview, it, it kind of hit because it's like man, you know. She was a very active wrestler, uh, you know, on the independents well after her WWF and WCW days. I, I think a lot of people don't realize that, um, you know, that she was a, she always a wrestler. Um, she became more known as a valet and a manager, but she continued to wrestle um, and wrestled all, quite a bit um, up through the early 2000s, um, you know, on independent shows around the, around the country, really. Yeah, and and speaking of other uh, women wrestlers, it was it was nice to see um, Lacey Von Erich in there. Um, it yeah. se it seemed like she kind of had a short career in pro wrestling, but um, just like right now uh, in uh, Major League Wrestling, they they uh, a couple sons of one of the Von Erics is a tag team in there now. 
Um, yeah, Kevin's Kevin's sons. Yep. Yeah, and so I don't know. I, I think it would it would be nice for her to come back. Maybe not necessarily as a wrestler if if she doesn't want to do that, but maybe as a as a valet form, possibly. Um, yeah. When when we started filming uh, this around this time, Lacey well, had just gotten. Uh, she was in uh, what was Florida Championship Wrestling at the time, the WWE uh, developmental territory, and she'd just come off of there, and she was starting to wrestle some independent shows right as we started filming. Um, and we happened to be at a show together. You know, we were filming at one show that she happened to be on. Um, and yeah, it was right at the very, very beginning of her of her in-ring you know, sort of career there. Um, you know, and she went on, obviously, after the film to, to TNA um, and had a good run there. And yeah, you know, now I... You know, she she left wrestling after a while. She was doing some acting uh, stuff and uh, TV and movie stuff. And I know now she's got a couple kids. And yeah, it's, she had a she had a good run. But yeah, the uh, the Von Eric legacy uh, definitely still still living on. Oh yeah, um, and kind of one of the young superstars that you got that now is. Uh, on a very bigger stage now uh, is Rhett Titus. Uh-huh. Um, just seeing where he is now and where y'all filmed him at, kind of like literally just a couple years into his career and, and seeing, seeing kind of like the awkward moment of him having to leave and, and his his son not wanting him to leave and asking him why it kind of kind of hit me emotionally of like the struggle that a father who's a pro wrestler has to go through if he has children. Yeah, absolutely, and you know it was uh, it, yeah. Rhett was around uh, NWS. He was an NWS uh, regular at that time when he just sort of was first starting out and. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was at his house when we were we were there filming. Just sort of it was a regular day, you know, regular event day. Um, and his son, yeah, that was a, a sort of a, a, a touching moment that I was absolutely not uh, expecting. But uh, yeah, it was definitely very real, very real uh, sort of feeling. You know, you, your heart breaks. Yeah, and, and it was interesting. Um, because backstage, I want to say it was Kevin Sullivan, basically was telling him that he was, that he had it basically, and that he was he was going to make money in this business. And I mean, yeah. I mean he is. I mean he's doing very well for himself. Last time I saw. Um, yeah, definitely. He's, he's been with Ring of Honor for for many years now. So yeah. And that was uh, another gen- genuine moment. Kevin, uh, we were filming with Kevin, and we were at an NWS show, and, and uh, we had been filming with Rhett previously, before we were filming with Kevin. Um, and, uh, yeah, so th- that, that interaction just sort of happened, and I ran over, uh, you know, to, well, wait, if you guys are going to talk, let me, <laughs> let me film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hold, hold on, can you, can you say all that again for me? Yeah, my, my, my worlds are colliding here. Yeah, I need to get this on camera. So it was uh, I, I noticed that happening in the back of the uh, of the uh, building there, and I, I ran over to, to catch what I could. But yeah, no, I, I mean I think right from the beginning, um, you know, I mean that's part of the reason why we started filming with Rhett. You know, is because we saw how good he was, and we thought, you know, here's a guy who has a lot of potential. Um, you know. To, to, to really become something. So that was, yeah, he was someone we started filming with because of that. I'm glad to see he's still, uh, you know, being very successful. And y'all got into a serious topic a little bit after the red kind of portion of it. Talking about steroids in the business, um, getting an interview from uh, superstar Billy Graham about it. And this young wrestler who was doing it, uh, you actually got a shot of him shooting up. Um, and this guy at the time uh, was named Corvus Fear. Um, how did you convince him to let you get that shot? Uh, 
uh, there, there was no convincing, I and mean, it was just part of part of his routine uh, at that time. And we were filming with a lot of the, the people who were NWS regulars and independent regulars, um, you know, around the around the area. And you know, to make a, a ninety minute documentary, uh, we had hundreds of hours of footage. Um, so we filmed with a lot of people, you know, throughout throughout the, the course of this, and he was one of the people we filmed with, and we filmed with a bunch of others, and that was just part of his routine, his, his you know, what was going into him trying to, to make it in the business, and I think it, it's a testament to the levels uh, that some of these guys are willing to go to, you know, put their bodies at risk, um, you know, to try and, to try and be successful. Um, but yeah, superstar uh, Billy Graham was very passionate. Uh, obviously, he was. Uh, I mean, if you look back at wrestling, no one looked like superstar. True. When he came around. Uh, uh, he was one of the first people to sort of have that look. Um, and he, I don't want to say credits himself. I think that's the wrong word. But I think he, in some ways, blames himself. Um, mm. I don't want to speak for him, but yeah. I think you know. He, he has some, I don't know if it's guilt, but you know, he definitely recognizes that when he came into wrestling, uh, it changed sort of the landscape of what of what guys were expected to look, to look like. Because, you know, before that, they looked like the Crusher uh, <laughs> and the Bruiser. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and they, they weren't exactly, uh, you know, physical uh, Adonises, but, you know, just more brooding big guys. And he was one of the first people to really have that chiseled, Steroid, uh, I guess, um, you know, produced look. But yeah, yeah and it, it was nice to see that um, afterwards, uh, Corvus decided to quit the steroids, and uh, it, it was it was nice to see that. Yeah, you know, I think people, you know, you also have to remember, and you mentioned the Vice uh, TV documentary, and this film coincided in a lot of ways with the, 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 uh, what was going on um, with, you know, obviously Chris Benoit and the steroid sort of hysteria that came out of that situation. Um, we were filming with everyone during that time. So once sort of that happened, you know, it definitely changed the landscape uh, of, of wrestling in a big way um, and sort of the perception of which that, you know, guys were, you know, maybe realizing they didn't need to be sort of big artificially um, you know, generated muscle you know uh, machines at that point and then that's sort of the you know the, the, the whole industry sort of turned so yeah I think I think a lot of guys who, who had been doing things um, you know either stopped or, or saw the that wasn't necessary. Yeah, and kind of as you see nowadays in pro wrestling, it's um, a very different look now um, compared yeah. to kind of like the pre Chris Benoit um, muscle men. Yeah, yeah, even when we were filming the movie, I mean, you know, that was, I mean, at this point, 15 you know, plus years ago, but uh, it, it, it was a very different industry um, when when that movie was made you know uh, the guys on TV were enormous you know <laughs> monsters yeah uh, you know muscle you know muscles the size of my whole body so it was you know it, it definitely a changing uh, a changing business at that point you know, big time because we were filming 2006 seven eight nine is when the film was, was shot so um, yeah, if you look at the roster of WWE then and the roster of WWE now, it looks very, very different. Oh yeah, Russell, the whole industry. Um, and then kind of the the final um kind of person y'all did uh, dive into was Sabu. Um, yep. And during that time, it was supposedly kind of like his last year in wrestling. Um. That's what he said. Yeah, that's you know, the... Years later, he's still he, going. Yeah, I, I think I saw him in Impact Wrestling recently. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 But it was, it was interesting to kind of see his family history um, going back to the Sheik and how much 
his body has went through. I I mean, you got close up of of scars on his stomach. Um, at one point, he was like paralyzed. Like yeah, he broke his back right 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 before we were filming with him, just uh, six six or six months or so before. Yeah. And I, if I remember right, he said he even kept wrestling, and the only reason he stopped was during like a few days off. He woke up one morning and he was like, "Oh, I can't walk." Yeah, I mean, you know, I I grew up in New Jersey uh, in the '90s, so you know, I was a teenager in the '90s, or you know, early teens in the '90s. So ECW to me was. That, that was the end all be all. Oh yeah. W was everything, um, especially where I grew up. You know, this was, it was local. Um, so Sabu was, you know, my, it was Sabu and Terry Funk, and they were my two favorite wrestlers always. So um, getting Sabu, you know, to be part of the film, and especially at that point in his career, he had just come back from his injury. I mean, you know, there's no one who's who's put themselves through more um, than than he had. You know, I was uh, a tape trader, uh, you know, in the, in the 90s and early 2000s, and buying tapes, you know, compilation tapes, and so the Sheik was, was one of my favorite wrestlers, too, even though I, you know, it was way past when I would have had the opportunity to see him live, um, but yeah, so to be able to, to film with Sabu uh, at that point in his career, and also to sort of talk about the Sheik, uh, you know, was huge, uh, huge for me, so yeah, when you, you're going back to, you know, the mark out uh, moments, um, being around Sabu for a few weeks uh, to, to shoot that, that segment was, was huge for me, yeah. So how was the documentary received not only within the in the business, but also with fans? Uh, you know, someone said, um, I think it was Taz at the time, said, you know, that it was as real as real gets uh, when it comes to a wrestling documentary. And that's the best endorsement uh, that there can be, you know, not only because it's Taz, another, uh, you know, uh, star in the, in the business, but, you know, uh, I didn't, coming from having worked, you know, in independent wrestling for, for a few years and being around it, my goal was to just make a movie that was real and showed it the right way uh, and showed it the, the honest way. And I think, you know, some people, you know, fans and whatnot over the years have said it's a very good dark and depressing movie and it certainly was not the intention um, but just by virtue of, of what I was filming in some cases that was the situation um, but you know I, I, I wasn't uh, you know a filmmaker first I was a wrestler you know wrestling um, fan and then you know a wrestling referee first um, so at that point you know that's my, my goal was to portray it honestly um, so whenever I hear someone who agrees with that, um, you know, makes me feel very, you know, like I did what I went out, set out to accomplish. So that's uh, that's the best I could I could you know, ask for. Yeah, and uh, like I said, I watched the documentary. Um, I enjoyed it very much. Um, I didn't think it was too dark at all. I, I think it told the truth and so and showed the truth um, and the reality of the business, um, which I appreciate very much because you kind of appreciate things more understanding everything that happens behind the curtain. Yeah. Um, what was the last thing you heard? <laughs> uh, you just watched the movie, and then I, that was the last thing I, I got. All right. So, like I said, I um, just wa- I watched the movie. Um, I enjoyed it. Um, I thought that the reality of it um, needed to be out there because not only does it help show what they go through, but it makes me as a fan appreciate it 
um, way more of what they go through behind the curtain. Um, yeah, and I think that, you know, being around wrestling when I was in high school, you know, I was working on shows when I was in high school, and, you know, by that time, a lot of my friends and people who I was in school with were not fans anymore. You know, the Attitude Era was over. Uh, certainly the Hulk Hogan era that we grew up with was over. And a lot of people had moved on and, you know, working around it, you hear a lot of, you know, you hear a lot of talk. You know, people in, in school, you know, that take, uh, you know, all, all the typical things that, that non-fans will say. And I, I thought, well, maybe I have an opportunity to show people what I what I got to see, uh, you know, working behind the scenes um, and, you know, sort of show them what the what's really like for these guys. And I think... I'm very honored to hear you say that because that was the that was the goal to show it how it really was and sort of give people an appreciation for what these guys go through. So let's talk about a uh, I think I think it would be very nice um, to see another one of these from you. Uh, you did such a good job. Do you do you have any plans or wanting to kind of produce another pro wrestling documentary? You know, I, I've thought about it a lot over the years. Um, the, the business is so vastly different from uh, what it was when I was filming that. Um, I still am in touch with a lot of people in the wrestling world. I talk to Kevin Sullivan pretty frequently. I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely in touch with people uh, still. Um, I'm not sure if I, if I have it in me <laughs> to do another one. Um, you know, that one, uh, we started filming in 2005. Um, and, and right at the end of 2005 through 2006, 7, 8, 9, came out in 2010, was distributed in 2011, uh, and you know that kept me busy through 2012. So that's basically a six-year uh, you know chunk of my life uh, that I would not you know take back for a, a second. It was a, a huge highlight for me, but uh, I don't know. I don't know if I, if I have it. <laughs> To, to get back out there and do another wrestling documentary, but I'm I'm, uh, I'm very flattered that you would uh, <laughs> that you'd like that. <laughs> um, so uh, are you doing anything now? Yeah, I work in television now. Um, you know, I uh, I work uh, as a producer in TV um, and keep myself uh, busy with independent you know film projects, uh, scripted projects, not documentaries anymore. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I definitely keep myself busy, and I have a short film out now um, that's in the, fest, in the film festival circuit, which has, you know, been uh, <laughs> postponed about a million times across the country from, yeah. uh, from what we're going through at the moment. But, yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, definitely keep myself busy, uh, just uh, you know, away from the wrestling uh, business for for now. <laughs> um. So, where can we find a uh, card subject to change? Sure, it is. Uh, it's 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 home is on Amazon Prime. Um, it's free to watch if you're a Prime member. Uh, and otherwise, if you're not a member, you can rent it or buy it on there. Um, and that is the extended edition. That's uh, after ten years, we went through the uh, through the archives and through the, the hard drives and pulled a ton of new footage uh, that was not in the original release uh, that was out on DVD. Um, so the, the only way to see this stuff uh, is on the Amazon Prime, um, and it is uh, Hard Search to Change, the extended edition. And that is the only way you're going to have to find out about the Jake, Terry, and Trent story, because it's on the extended part. And That's right, yeah. That story alone is is worth the the watch. Um, so where can uh, my viewers and listeners uh, find you at? Sure, yeah, I have uh, my, my works up on timdisbro.com, um, and I, I try to keep that as updated as I can. I'm not super great at keeping that up to date. <laughs> I try my best. <laughs> Um, and anytime I do something, I, I try and put it up there after a while. But yeah, I mean, the big thing, you know, is definitely uh, parts of it to change.com will take you to the Amazon page. Um, you know, it's out there somewhere or the old DVDs, but uh, yeah, that timdisbro.com and parts of it to change.com. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for letting me interview you. Um, it's been a pleasure. And um, yeah, stay safe and healthy. 
you as well. You as well. Thank you so much. It was uh, it was great to great to chat with you and great to after a few years, you know, remember back to, to making cards of the chain. All right. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the Iceberg Lounge. Special thanks to Tim Disbro for coming by and doing the interview with us. Um, go check him out wherever you can. Um, like, comment, share, and subscribe to this podcast. Um, if you'd like to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash trji. And for a dollar a month, you become a VIP of the Iceberg Lounge. But besides that, um, stay safe, stay healthy, and always remember, all to God.